You're listening to Living It Up in Lion City, a podcast about Singapore, where locals and foreigners sit down, chill, crack open a beer, and talk about life here and what goes on in this amazing city. Hello, everyone. Welcome to yet another awesome episode oh, of Living It Up stuff. in Lion City, a podcast about Singapore, about life in Singapore, and living here from the perspective of both a local. Oh, that's me, uh, Raj. Raj. And a foreigner, <laughs> Sunny. And joining us in this particular episode is... Uh, Patrick. Hi, Patrick. Uma, from Singapore. Yes. Uh, and we're here to talk about what it means to be a foreigner, or what's it like being a foreigner. Be it in Singapore or be it somewhere else. Mm. Uh, hi, uh, my name is Uma. I'm a Malay Singaporean. Uh, I've been living in Singapore my whole life. Uh, a while, a few years ago, I was living in New Zealand for about 10 months or so. I was on a working holiday visa. So it gives me a little bit of a perspective about uh, how it's like to be Singaporean living overseas. Not for a long time, 10 months is still small compared to some other people. But I think it's, um, some valuable insights that I can share. And Patrick? Um, yeah, so my name is Patrick. I've been living in Singapore for a year and a half or so. I'm from Canada originally. Um, this is my first time living overseas. And it's, it's pretty different, I'd say. Um, it's, it's about as different as you can get from like North America, I'd say, Asia. <laughs> um, but yeah, so I mean, being here for like a year and a half has given me a good, I think, perspective on both life as a local in North America and life as a foreigner in Asia and just general life in Asia. So here's a question for both of you. Um, what was different? Okay, so Umar, you, you came back from New Zealand. Uh-huh. Um, oh. Or rather before, like, you know, you came back to New, uh, from New Zealand, what was different, or what was the first thing that you experienced um, over there within the first month? Mm-hmm. All right, I'll start with my preconceptions of New Zealand. Okay. So previously, it's when I went to New Zealand, it was my first time. I didn't know what to expect. Uh, when I spoke to other people, from what I understand, it would be something similar to Australia. Uh, but as soon as I hit there, the first thing I realized was that New Zealand is has a lot of similarities, but it's totally different from uh, Australia. So from the get-go, you can notice really, really early would be the pace of life. Definitely, this is very easy. The pace of life in New Zealand is much more relaxed. Okay. Like to be slower? F- yes, much slower. So to be fair, I first landed in Auckland which was a major city. So in Auckland, it's a city similar to Singapore, but even then you can tell the people are more chill, they're more friendly, they're more open. Um, the first place that I stayed was, uh, it was opposite a church that was doing gay weddings, for example. So this is something I never seen in Singapore. So every Sunday, looking out my balcony, I would see a couple of weddings, some gay weddings. So um, what shocked me the most when I was in New Zealand was uh, pretty much how they treat um, the, their life balance, right? So their life does not revolve around work, does not revolve around um, paying the bills, you know, family. So they're more liberal, right? So New Zealand is about as liberal as you can get, uh, aside from America. But um, people over there, they just really take work-life balance seriously. Like when they go to work, um, they end on time, um, they don't you know, stay back late and try to give this impression that they're working hard and even the boss, even the superiors and the workers on both ends, they know that they all have life outside of work. But so, uh, can I ask, mm-hmm. Omar, um, is, is that different from what you see in Singapore? Prior to moving to New Zealand, I was working full time. So the culture working with a Singaporean company in Singapore and um, working in New Zealand would be that Singaporeans, we value commitment and, um, you know, hardworking, to be hardworking, it's a, it's a virtue. So people who stay, you know, late for work and people who come on time and people, you know, uh, they need to be seen and heard in the office. So that's really important for Singapore. I'm not going to generalize all <laughs> companies in Singapore, but I'm going to say the, the companies that are local, 
which is like majority. I would say more than 60%. So you're basically company. saying the SMEs and SMCs? Um, I haven't worked every company in Singapore, <laughs> but I think, yes, majority leaning towards that. Right, yeah. right. So what I notice is that um, being hardworking is important, um, staying late, doing your work, you know, sometimes they work after hours. So over there, um, sorry, over here, um, even though you sign a contract that says you're nine to five, for example, yeah. most people work till seven or eight. Yeah, yeah five, the contract five. is just rubbish. Right? The contract is just you know. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But right. where else over there? They they really take it seriously, man. I mean, whether uh, they come on time, yes, they do. But once they end work, or they they tend to get flexible as well. Sometimes they come late uh, to work and then they end late. You know, it all depends on work. Right? So as long as they get the shit done, they get their work done, everything's good. So to answer your question, yes, that was one big culture shock which I had uh, when I was there. So it's the pace of life and the working environment and of course the weather. <laughs> weather is just cool. Right? So I'm guessing yeah. the weather would be much cooler. Like, well, I, I guess like New Zealand has four seasons, right? Yeah, they yeah, have yeah, four yeah, seasons. Yeah. And mm. I was, when I landed, it was winter. So it was cold as balls. Man. <laughs> Seriously. <laughs> uh, to be fair, I'm not a big fan of winter. So I'm, yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm not missing that. Dude, compared to this weather right now, oh, for context, uh, we are basically sitting outside of um, Sunny's apartment balcony so you can hear the water running. So it's a pretty messed up view, but a nice sound and environment. And it's humid as fuck. Yeah, it's humid as hell. I like it that way. Yeah. Given a choice between having four seasons and summer all year long, I would choose summer all year long. I would choose four seasons. But, okay. That's that's do the change. At least you know seasons, it's okay. seasons are nice, but three months of winter really sucks. Well, three months, months, all three months of winter, winter yeah. three like three minus, months of winter, yeah, as far really as weather's concerned, really you know, Canadians' opinions don't count. <laughs> 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 all right, eight months of winter, winter. <laughs> season. So, try doing that for eight months, yeah. and, and your see, summer, you still yeah, like and winter. your summer is like what two days. Uh, two months, two months, <laughs> if we're lucky. Wow. No, so I, I was just messing with <laughs> You're probably loving it here in Singapore. <laughs> yeah, it's nice. I don't mind the weather. Really All right. Nice. So the question now comes to Patrick. Uh, the biggest thing I noticed. I think well, my first stop in Asia ever was uh, was Mumbai, and I landed at, like, midnight. Okay. So I think the biggest, like, the first thing was just the amount of people and how, like, lively it was. Because um, I understand, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I was in a cab at like one a.m. and everyone's like out and about, and the yeah. streets are just like there's like lights hanging everywhere, and people are outside like drinking, eating, having fun. So I think that was the biggest. It kind of wait. You don't have that in Canada. One a.m. and people are hanging outside. No, no, no. But in Canada, like for, to put it in perspective, we have thirty six million people across the entire country, and, and like I've heard like Mumbai s- alone has like. It has like 20 something million. It's got like, it's got 12 within city limits if I'm not wrong. Yeah. And then it goes to about 20, like including the suburbs. Yeah, just, and just and the numbers are like the, the second largest country in the world, right? Yeah, second largest country. Land wise. Land wise. But yeah, you don't so. You have too many people. So, so you <laughs> have a lot of space. So I think that was it. It was just how there's so many people. Yeah. It's Asia's very dense. I think yeah. that was the biggest thing I had to get used to. Um, like, especially going through parts of like India and like Hong Kong. But Singapore is better organized so i didn't okay. get that here like you feel like it's you don't feel the amount of people that actually live here okay, okay. Wait, don't you don't you actually feel it when you go to work uh yeah, yeah if you're uh, during rush hour you feel it during lunchtime you feel it <laughs> yeah but then like if you've been to russia or mumbai i'm never gonna do that i've heard stories and scary stories i do not want to do that like uh yeah. so so basically not sure if you can take the mumbai train during the lunch rush hour <laughs> So I've heard stories whereby <laughs> even a person who's living in Mumbai is scared of taking that train. Because yeah. people were hanging off the sides. Yeah, yeah. yeah they yeah. were. So one, so one of, I think he basically did it once with his cousin who usually take the train. You just push people whatever, whenever, just to get off your station or get onto your train. <laughs> and he did it once with him. His cousin basically hold, held his collar and threw him out of the train and got off the train. That's how you roll, you know? <laughs> like, Mumbai is all about the hustle. <laughs> it's it's I mean, yeah, so, yeah, sorry to interrupt, man. Uh, no, no, I mean, that, that was just my first impression of, like, Asia. So it was it was kind of what I was expecting, but still, like, it was a lot to take in at once. Coming from, like, Canada to, you okay. know, the streets of Mumbai, like, 1 a.m. So it was I'm, I'm so different. I, okay. I had an amazing experience, um, 
So that like, Mumbai holds a special place in my heart because of that. This was like the first time seeing <laughs> three people in like a square inch. Yeah, and just like yeah, it was it was crazy. I, I loved it though. I loved it. Interesting. But then, what's it like in Canada? Though I'm super curious. Like, do you meet your neighbors every hundred kilometers? <laughs> every no, no, hundred no, kilometers. You have a lot. You have a lot more space. <laughs> like when, when you're on a subway and it's crowded in Canada, like you have enough room to like stretch your elbows. <laughs> if that makes sense, you still have like you still that have space. That is not shallow. I mean, that's, 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 like every, other, that that's like every other hour. <laughs> it's, it's just, you have a lot more space. Okay. Um, it, it comes down to everything. Like, even, like, your offices are a bit roomier. Your apartments and homes are roomier. There's more space between homes. <laughs> it's just kind of built into, like, because there's a lot more space there. Of course, of course. But could it also be because, I mean, it's a big country, and also could it be a difference between living uh, in the countryside in yeah. Canada versus living in the cities? So, for example, a big city like Vancouver or Toronto, I'm pretty sure that it has the same demographic pressure. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. That probably doesn't, not, not like in Mumbai, but maybe like in Singapore, does it have the same kind of, you know... It does, but I think culturally, people still have, you'd say, like, their comfort zone or their, like, their, like, personal bubble is a bit okay. larger and that people aren't as comfortable being as close to strangers. I see. For long periods of time. Okay, so they're not comfortable with me, like, getting within two inches of their face. Yeah, oh, that's dude, like, I'm, yeah. Not, I'm not even comfortable with <laughs> that, man. Oh, man. Like, who's comfortable with that? Like, when, like, really dense cities, like, that's just the norm, and you have to get used to it. Because you're missing I'm, out, dude. I've been to, <laughs> so I've been to India a few times, right? And whenever I'm speaking to, like, someone from there, so my friends are pretty cool, so they know, they know about personal space and all that, so, so this is the distance that we talk. Yeah. But when I'm speaking to strangers, it's like, and I'll be moving backwards, it's like, I'm, yeah, that's that's the place I want to go. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's also there. But then again, I mean, it also depends on which particular part of India you're in. So in Mumbai, for example, of course, personal space is Delhi. luxury. Nobody fucking yeah. affords. Yeah. Mumbai, Delhi. Yeah, and even the... Bangalore to an extent. I, w- I would say that Bangalore is quite similar to Singapore in that it is pretty crowded, um, but it also has that certain level of, you know, space between people that you can like step a foot apart from someone else and have a regular conversation not have like 300 people like, <laughs> cram themselves within that space right um, but that's interesting personal space has that been a problem for you since not, not moving? so much here I think okay. in other parts of Asia yeah I would like to, when I started to a degree but your comfort zone grows okay uh, but I think in Singapore one thing I really noticed is um, people are very blunt like extra- as in like so in, in like Canada forward. yeah very straightforward so in Canada there's like you tend to like beat around the bush when it comes to personal things, but in Singapore, like if I get back from vacation and I've gained like any weight, it did, everyone you, you will you let me know. Oh, everyone, okay. will <laughs> let me know. Right? Like, everyone, like by the way, like you've you've definitely gotten fatter, <laughs> just <laughs> straight up to your face, like many times throughout the day. Like so I've heard this so much. From oh, a did lot you get that from Phuket? Yeah. yeah. Like even my yeah. girlfriend would talk about saying that you know when they have. You know, family gatherings, all that's the first thing that they say as a man. That's like small talk, but is that really true, Umar? Is that, is that something that's like common across uh, all of Singapore? I, I think it depends on personality, but okay. it's leading towards true. Some yeah, people, I would say true as well. Some people do beat around the bush, um, but some people are just outright blunt. Uh, especially if you're talking about friends wise or family, yes, outright blunt. <laughs> but when it comes to strangers, you do practice text. Depending on people, okay. yeah. I would say it's it's like we all have that terrible auntie, right? You know, like, <laughs> she's always that bitch in the family, right? Yeah. <laughs> and that's always there. So I'm just curious, like, is that is that a, like a norm, normal behavior, or is just like a personal characteristic on their part? And you think that that's a, I've, I've a general characteristic, yeah? Um, maybe in other parts of Asia too, but I just definitely noticed it. Like, definitely at work, okay. we're just yeah, at work we're very like blunt. With they with don't hold back. Yeah, same thing. It's like, so which girl did you screw last night? I was like, what? Yeah. <laughs> and like. In front of my boss and everything, I was like, "No, I didn't do anything, man. Come on." Or like, if you're looking like really bad, you're sick. They'll like tell you, like, "You look awful." By yeah. The way. I, oh yeah. You I look got, like garbage. I, 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 today, I, I, by I, the way. I got that on Monday, and Tuesday. <laughs> it's like, <laughs> you look. Terrible. Are you okay? Are you sick? That's yeah. medicine and you're like, over no, there. No, no, I'm, I'm fine. I'm fine. Like, cause you look awful. <laughs> Just so you know, awful. Huge eye bags. Yeah. <laughs> well, that's the thing, right? So, I mean, I can understand that people are showing concern by uh-huh. asking these questions, but. Is it the case that if you have friends that are close to you in Canada or your colleagues in Canada, do they not ask these questions? Oh yeah, yeah, they might, they might. I think it's more of um, they take a more indirect approach. But like work colleagues aren't as close, so they wouldn't be as forward. Like they wouldn't, they wouldn't bluntly say like you've gained weight. If anything, I think you get the opposite. Where oh, if, you, my if you say like I got I gained weight, close, they would like try to shoot it down. But like, nah, you know, who who doesn't gain some weight on a holiday? Like, but here I've definitely noticed it's like. I step in the office after, especially after the vacation, <laughs> and they're just like, "Yeah, 
He's fatter. He's fatter, right? It's <laughs> <laughs> just like. <laughs> Did you face that in New Zealand? I don't believe that that's a cultural thing. I think it's just a personality thing. I think it's very cultural. When you were working, when you were living in, uh, in New Zealand, I felt that it's a personal thing as well. It, it didn't happen to me when I was in New Zealand, of course. Then again, I did not build any relationship to any Kiwis that were that close. I uh, had a few friends, yes, but none were in that boundary. You know. Then again, to be fair... So no one broke down that barrier to go into that closer zone. Omar, you're fat! <laughs> <laughs> He's not, but... To be fair, <laughs> when I went fit. over, I just... <laughs> just came down, so it was... <laughs> There's no basis of comparison for them. Okay. You know? So, uh, Umar, can I ask you about your mm. life in New Zealand? Like, what were you doing there? And, you know, how do you keep yourself occupied? In the uh, okay, in so in New Zealand, there? my original intention was to find a job, a full-time job over there. Uh, but after staying a couple of months in Auckland, I decided to move on uh, to other opportunities and do the working, traveling thing properly. So um, I led a nomadic lifestyle where I would go from city to city, just finding work. So I would move on to a city, look for work for a couple of months and move off. Um, but there was a particular city in the north of um, New Zealand, which was called Monganui. So okay. it's an area in Monganui, so I stayed there the longest. So I thought well, about what, what actually two attracted you to. Uh, okay, so just imagine it's really paradise compared to what I face in Singapore. So basically, the, it is a stretch where there's beach on the right and on the left, and at the end of the stretch is a mount. It's a mount, not a mountain, it's a mount. So it's similar to Faber. So it's high for a couple of hundred meters. Uh, so one side of the beach faces the sunset, one side of the beach faces the sunrise. So my hostel that I was staying was somewhere in the middle. So it was just really awesome, the lifestyle over there. People were just really chill and everyone was working and we were coming to work together. Wake up early in the morning, you know. Just unlike Singapore where, you know, you tend to sleep late. You know, when you're in New Zealand, people don't sleep late. You know? Really? <laughs> That's, I mean... Yeah, but I, I guess because they shut everything down for like five or something. Not just that. Uh, I guess people have work early in the morning as well. Uh, but it's not like Singapore where everything comes alive mostly after work. Yes. Right? <laughs> so over there, uh, life goes on whether you have work or not. People are just chilling out at the beach, whether it's summer or whether it's winter. Still, uh, wait, even people, in winter? Yes. You see, in New Zealand, I can't speak for every other country, but I would say outside of Southeast Asia, this is probably true. People embrace the sun. When it's daytime, people go out, people have fun, people take as much daytime as they can. Whereas in Singapore, People are working in daytime, almost everyone. You're either in school or you're working. Simply said. So people embrace the night time. So after work, people go out, people have drinks, people do this. You know, Singapore is known for, you know, the light festival, the night festival. The <laughs> everything, stars, whatever, city, oh, you're city right. lights. Singapore doesn't have a day festival. <laughs> we don't have a day festival. Right? Whatever day <laughs> festival that we try to do, they're all fixed. Yeah. Maybe we should have some, but we, no one will turn up. <laughs> so my point is we embrace the night. In Singapore, uh, I can't say so for every other country, but also because of the weather. So at night it's cooler. So people run at night, people jog at night, people exercise at night, people go to the gym at night, people do barbecues at night. Whereas probably in Canada they do in the daytime. You know, you have a picnic outside. You, you know, you go out, you enjoy the sun, do a bit of sunbathing, go to the beach. Not so much in Singapore. So that's a contrast. Um. Okay. Okay. So. People in New Zealand glorify the sun. I'm sure you guys do too. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, two months, man. We've only got two months. Here <laughs> like, oh, sure comes the sun. <laughs> no, it is gone. <laughs> I would say it's a Western thing because uh, just think of it this way. So, despite being Asians, you may think of it as Asians. We don't embrace the sun as compared to Western people. But think of Africa. They're neither Asians nor Western. But do you think they embrace the sun, or do I, they, is it like Singapore where at night everything comes alive? I'm, I'm not sure. I I've never been there, so I'm, I'm in no place to comment. I've never know. been there. Um, I can say this as an Indian. I know that you know we have a fair share of sun, but that also. But you have more pollution than the sun. That depends on where you go. So I'm from Kerala, where we have like amazing climate. Yes, been to Kerala. Three months of the year, but then the other nine is raining. In fact, there's like a flood happening right now. Yeah, it's pretty mm -hmm. bad. Uh, but long story short, like if you go to the southern parts of India, we have like a fair degree of sunshine and all that. So we don't think of it as a novelty, you know. Uh, we don't glorify it like what we read about elsewhere. So yeah, the sun is up. That's uh, that's it's no biggie. So sorry, can I just inject something? Yeah. No, no, no. So I have one more thing. Uh, it just came up to me uh, with regards to difference in culture, right? So living here and living overseas. Tell me if you think this is true. Asians in general, 
we are happy when people around us are happy but western people in general they are happy when they are happy let me give you an example of what i mean so in asia we take a lot of effort to make sure people around us are happy especially friends and family yeah for example we take exams seriously look at china look at korea look at japan look at, okay, look at singapore singapore yes <laughs> so it's very important for us that we do our education really well so that our parents are happy they can break their uh, friends you know my son yeah. is good doctor footballer lawyer whatever that's in western they are more inclined to think that you are happy when you are happy so if for example let's put it in context of work right so you leave work early because you know when you're happy everyone is happy whereas in asia when you work and the company is happy people around you are happy your boss is happy your yeah, you don't get sheltered at <laughs> you're happy then you're happy <laughs> right so people get sucked into this whole mantra especially asians right so uh think of it as okay i'll, I'll put in another example during um our festival time chinese new year hari raya dipabali whatever right so when we visit our family um they always ask you know questions you know that kind of questions like are you uh, what's your work uh do you have a girlfriend yet are you married that kind of stuff right i i'm sure yeah as asians we know yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so uh with regards to that um we try to please them as much as possible so that's that's asians greatest weakness i feel we try to please other people so when when we can impress or please other people it makes us happy right you see chinese people they take pride really strongly so you know once uh you know when you go to a wedding you make sure your guest is happy it's a big wedding everyone gets and you make sure your guest pay food. you have 10 courses yeah so once everyone around you happy then you're happy whereas in western culture it's more of, okay you know uh it's my wedding you know give me gifts yeah uh register for gift here you know i'm going to i'm going to have my wedding over here so you guys to accommodate you know as long as i'm happy everything is happy question for patrick is this true <laughs> i can't speak for like european cultures but i know from like um we just speak about canada there's a, i mean there's definitely like in north america there's definitely a focus on individualism of course of course right, so it's it's more about like finding your own path and like looking for your own happiness and not living a life That's even like, even for like parents or family yeah i mean you could argue that like it i think it depends on the person but yeah like there's this they even like look at like media that comes out of like north america right all these movies and stuff are always about the not to achieve it basically yeah, I, yeah I, like I finding your own path and i think that's why you get so many travelers cuz like there are uh, the whole like if you compare like let's say growing up in like north america to growing up in asia from what i've seen it's like you know as as a young adult in north america you get like your parents even pressure you like to like to leave the, the nest to like go and like well that's mostly because they're sick of you they're like yeah <laughs> no, actually, no, get the fuck out there's that like thing of, like you kind of have to go off on your own like okay. you're going to have to like okay. fly off on your own uh, so people tend to move out very young um everyone who wants that like that uh what's that word wants that like um independence but i know here there's more of that traditional mm-hmm. obligation yeah. to your parents i yes. wouldn't say either one is like I wouldn't say there's like a superiority in one over the other. I think both to so extremes me, are not healthy. Let me give an uh, let me let me give an example about of myself. So I was about to leave uh the nest uh early this month or I think late last month. But the thing is after which uh I just couldn't leave home anymore. Mom gave me that very guilty <laughs> I mean she gave me a very bad guilt trip. It's like I'm, <laughs> I've made you who you are like you like what you are now and you're just going to ditch me. Mm-hmm. It's like mm-hmm. All right, ma'am. I'll right. stay. I'll help you guys out. I'll do it whatever you want me to do. Yeah. I noticed this when I was in New Zealand. Uh so I was working in a farm and then we were just talking about I was working for this guy. Uh he he has a farm and he gave a small portion of his farm to his daughter. So I was just having a discussion with him and then uh, it turns out I mentioned that I give money to my parents on a monthly basis and he is so shocked. He looked at me like, "What? You give money to your parents every month?" And then my daughter she said, "My daughter doesn't give me anything every month." And uh it just had a big cultural shock just right there now. So I just noticed this about Singaporeans as well. We give money to our parents. I can't say so for Asians not in Singapore, but I find this in Singapore even the Chinese people they give money to their parents and then um well foreigners usually they don't and another thing 
uh, taking care of your parents in Singapore probably because it's a small place yeah so in Singapore once your parents get old there's a tendency for I can't say this for everyone but there's a tendency for you to want to take care of your parents yeah you know so you want them to move in with you you know take care of them you have a maid you know take care of their needs or maybe you take care of their needs uh, and you know just grow uh, just stay uh, um, you know in a sense make sure they grow old yeah when they sweet. when they get senile for example when they can't walk properly you know help them to change help them to eat oh, so and so um, this is not something I see overseas um, okay okay but then do uh, you agree with me I, I don't mm-hmm. I, I don't think I do because mm-hmm. I don't think uh, that kind of you know wanting to give your parents love and care in their later years is something that's exclusive to Asian cultures mm-hmm. um, I don't know, uh, Patrick. Like, are, are you saying that you like? Don't do care most about your people leave at all? <laughs> like, okay, just not leave the coop. Then you're okay, like, you know, to, to be to be fair, I'm not saying you don't care at all. <laughs> it's just you take more hands-on approach about taking care of them, right? So uh, maybe Asians they do, you know, they bring their parents back to live with them, and but I don't know. Maybe this is something I see yeah. on the media when you see on TV and you see on movies. You know, your parents, even though they're old, they tend to be staying somewhere else. Either. Uh, both of your parents staying somewhere in a nursing home or yeah, just by themselves, I, you know, taking just, care of themselves. I just cannot mm-hmm. see my parents in a nursing home. Uh-huh. Yeah. I, I mean, can't speak for every Singaporean who do this. There are a lot of Singaporeans. I mean, there are, but I mean, yeah. I'm just speaking personally mm-hmm. that I just can't see them. I would rather sh- they stay with yeah. me or my sisters. So this is a cultural attitude difference between being a local and being a foreigner. I don't know if you agree with me. I don't know. I mean, hey, I'm Asian. <laughs> <laughs> what about you, Betty? Yeah, oh I mean, like, my, my grandparents are living with, like, with my aunt now, but they were on their uh-huh. own for a long time until they got sick, mm-hmm. just recently. So, because um, my, my family's originally from Poland. Mm-hmm. Sure. So on that side, like, I think that has a similar culture in that, like, you know, mm-hmm. they, they brought their grandparents into their home, and they have a big home with a lot of family members. Mm-hmm. Um, I would never put my mom in, like, a nursing home. Mm-hmm. Um, but I, I see what you mean. I think it is more common to have maybe older people living alone mm-hmm. on their own in, like, mm-hmm. at least North America. You see that a lot more. Mm-hmm. Um, then I've definitely seen more, like, live-in uh, parents mm-hmm. here. That seems to be more common. Like, larger families living together mm-hmm. versus, uh, this from is what I've seen, it's usually, like, smaller family units in mm-hmm. North America. I think this is more predominant in community-based countries. For example, Mexico, India, Singapore, yeah. Malaysia, Indonesia, you know, where community is um, but then community uh, forms culture community right? based yeah. culture yeah. Yeah. yeah so you're saying Canada doesn't have culture <laughs> is that what you're saying <laughs> no I mean does Canada have soul people <laughs> I mean, <laughs> I mean <laughs> hey, hey. <laughs> fuck you just put me in the spot man. I have no idea how to respond to that now <laughs> alright so Umar uh-huh. one thing that you absolutely hate about Singapore and New Zealand one thing about Singapore and New Zealand let's see. yeah I'll start with Singapore it's a whole list. <laughs> <laughs> Just one thing, absolutely w- the worst of the worst of the worst. Ah, okay. I think it will be the attitude, above all else, right? So there's not much to complain about Singapore. We have a great system, you know, we're efficient, we're clean. You know, people always fantasize us, you know, like we are good, like safe environment, <laughs> and you know, yeah. But uh, one thing I don't like about Singaporeans is the attitude. As cliche as it sounds, I really think that Singapore uh, is like, an adolescent, a sport, a child. Yes, uh, mm-hmm. going on that point, because I was told when uh, we, you know, that 11 of us were in Phuket, mm-hmm. and I went for a break, mm-hmm. and these guys were basically sitting at a restaurant. Uh, there were four of them with our backpacks and everything. Apparently, a Singapore, Singaporean family came up to them and told them, hey, why don't you guys move? Oh. This is like for a family table, for a family, and. Uh-huh. Oh, yeah, they were asking, they, add, they, know, they, they asked us politely to move, and they talked to the waitress. Cause um we had like we had like five or six people so we had two tables, and they said we have a family. Mm-hmm. Do you guys mind moving? We're gonna sit because we want to sit here. Mm-hmm. And the waitress intervened and she said, uh, "Oh, like no, they've been here first. And then he took it out on the waitress. Yeah, he basically told the waitress, "Do you Wait. have do you have any brains? Wait, how did they take it out on the waitress? Again? Or more of like um he asked us politely to move, but uh, then they like when the waitress said, "Oh, like they've they've got like five or six people. You know, they they've been here for like twenty minutes already." Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, so he just kind of like yeah he he more insulted her than like he didn't yeah, look at us so it's kind of like messed up right like mm-hmm. he was just like how are you supposed to like split a family like use your brain huh and he's like <laughs> that to the, the <laughs> yeah. I mean that's kind of messed up I mean that's the attitude 
So, so you go overseas and you behave like that. I'm like, but I mean, there's well, always like bad examples from a, every like yeah, every a bunch of, like, every group. The tourist population in general are dicks. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So I wouldn't, I wouldn't. Yeah, so I, that's why I was agreeing on Omar's point uh-huh. in regards to the ads too because mm-hmm. this is pretty uh, recent. Uh-huh. So uh, to point out specifically, uh, what I hate about Singapore is attitude, specifically entitlement. Right. So to be fair, Singapore we grew very advanced really quickly. So think of us as rich, but not rich kids. Like you're born into a rich family. Yeah. yeah. So most of us in Singapore we are that way. You know we do not understand the struggle needed to go through uh, how Singapore came to be today. Despite people's big hoo ha about you know and love SJWs. You know, I really think. What is SJW? Social, Social justice, justice warrior. warrior. Oh. Yeah. Okay. So wow, I gotta so really keep up with all these <laughs> acronyms. What rock have you been doing? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Wow. So, be- because of that, we felt that Singapore belongs to us. So, it's a piece of pie that we're just not willing to share. So, I'll put xenophobia aside. But it's something we felt that um, we felt everyone feels that we have contributed to it. But the truth is, it's not true. Not everyone, just because you go through national service doesn't mean you have contributed to Singapore's building. You know, I hear a lot of Singaporeans online when they have a discussion with Malaysia. It always comes back to yeah, at least my currency is like three times better. And in my opinion, like come on, bullshit. Did you actually <laughs> help to contribute to make that three to one, or are you just reaping the benefits? It's like your your dad is giving you lots of money as a rich kid, and then you're just laughing at the poor kids. You know, like hey, I'm a rich family. You know, so I deserve all this. You know, I work hard for living. Yeah, so but it's actually your dad feeding you. So that's the like when my friends mm-hmm. and I we go uh, Malaysia, right? I uh-huh. like. Whenever they say, oh, this is so cheap, this is so cheap, I'll try to tell them, you know what, tell, tell that to us like back in the hotel, yeah, don't where it's, don't it's like okay when it's all yeah. tourists and stuff, yeah. but do not do it outside because these guys are like, yeah. you know, it's their yeah. normal day-to-day living. Yeah. So basically, it's that sort of entitlement that I, do, I don't really like in Singapore, to be honest. Mm. We gotta stay humble, you know? We gotta be like, like that song. <laughs> Stay that's humble. A, I don't know. That's a Malay down, proverb. Bitch. Be <laughs> humble. There's a Malay proverb that says that uh, be like rice. When the more you grow, the more you bend. Don't be like bamboo. The more you grow, the taller you get. What is it that absolutely hated about your time in New Zealand? Mm-hmm. Okay. So um, this is from a foreigner's perspective. Mm-hmm. Once again, you know. Sure. Yeah. So this is from my personal opinion. Yeah. Okay. Of course, you guys don't have to agree with me. Uh, Personally, I don't really like the cold, but that's just a small portion. What I don't really like about New Zealand is something I'm too used to in Singapore, which is efficiency. Right. So, New oh. Zealand, yes. Of course, there's it no problem. It boils down to entitlement, doesn't it? <laughs> <laughs> oh, shit. Oh, no, shit. <laughs> sure. I mean, but to be fair, I did not ask to be grown up in Singapore. <laughs> to be, you know, to be, gr- I mean, no one chooses where they used to be born. That's right. So, you can't blame a rich kid for being born in a rich family, just as you can't blame a poor kid for being poor family. So, so being in Singapore, I've grown up to a certain level of efficiency. Okay. Yeah. I, yeah, I mean, mm-hmm. yes, I um, agree with you on that. Could you, yeah. could you uh, ex- explain with some detail? Okay. So for example, if I want to open up a bank account in Singapore, easy. Go to the bank, fill out a few forms, done. Yeah, give your IC yeah. form, done. But over there, when you want to do some administration, uh, administrative work, whether it's open up a bank or sign up for a line or various other things which I did in the past. Uh, there's a certain level of waiting time and you know, um, even when I was in an apartment and there was a problem with my apartment, when I call, uh, when I use the phone to call for Maintenance. the superintendent for the building, I think, I believe I called him around um, 2 p.m. on a Sunday, if I'm not mistaken. He, he just called me over the phone and said, why are you calling me on a Sunday? Don't you know I have a life? Blah, 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 blah. You know, in Singapore, that shit will never fly. You know, if you have a problem, if you're building an apartment and you need something done, even on a Sunday, even on, say, like, 9 p.m. at night. Yeah, for example, they will leakage. Exactly. They will head down and they will helicopter you and they will <laughs> do all the things. Where else in New Zealand? So, it's not New Zealand's fault. It's just something I am used to. So, I have to adapt. To of course, of course. Yeah. So the this is true for any of us in any problems yeah, that whenever we travel. I mean, I've, I've faced that a few times exactly. after which it's yeah. just that it's, it's very hard to get used to it, but yeah. slowly and steadily no you get used to no it. No matter how hate you, uh, no matter how much you hate other countries, just remember 
Um, it's not their fault. This is their culture. You are going in. <laughs> you are the one. You know. You are going in with a preset mindset. It's your fault. Yeah. So you need some time to them. So. Hey man, I just write preset mindset. <laughs> but here's the deal, though. But is sure. is that is efficiency something that uh, a culture should aspire to? Yes. Um. It's a, for me. It's a direct yes. Depends. I mean, there are there are priorities. Right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Different culture have different priorities. Maybe in your country, efficiency in terms of you know administrative work and all this is not a big priority. But maybe to us, we've grown up in an environment where this is a priority because we are so used to you know that kind of lifestyle that we demand that kind of lifestyle. So okay, go go. I mean, putting your point forward, or uh, rather, going on to your point. Mm-hmm. The thing is that when we apply for something, we are given a deadline, and oh. we have to work to that deadline. Mm-hmm. And that's why everything we needed to be fast, fast, fast to be done ASAP, ASAP, mm-hmm. ASAP to hit that deadline. Okay. But maybe for other countries, that deadline is not exact. It's not too close, mm-hmm. so they don't really need to be that swift. Well, in Singapore, client is king. You know, yeah, if customer. you get the work, if if you meet the expectation more than what is required in Singapore, that's considered a treasure, a value, a virtue. You know, if you can deliver something to your client really fast or your customer really fast, uh, then it will just push the normal boundary, right? So it will keep pushing, keep pushing. So something that you can be done that needs to be done for five days, if you can get it done by three days, uh, and you keep hitting that three days, they will push the boundary. That, so that's, three that, days that will that be your normal line. Exactly. So you keep pushing the boundary. So this has happened in Singapore in the past. So it's you keep pushing the boundary. Actually. That's why we are so used to that kind of speed. Whereas in overseas, they actually push back. Where at least in New Zealand, they will push back. You know, so they, they, when they say that they need five days, they will need five days. You know, even if they end early, they won't. Act- I don't think they will actually report it. They will just you know set customer expectation. So cu- customer is not king. You know, they have a good balance. That's why I like. I mean, setting customers' expectation is usually the best way to work. But mm-hmm. when depends, customers depends on what you want in your company. Yeah, but I mean, but when the customer, when you're dealing with a customer that needs something to be done and he sets the deadline, mm-hmm. whereby you are unable to, you know, uh-huh. uh, lie on him in a sense, mm-hmm. that you just have to follow it. Well, it depends on the attitude, ultimately. So over there, they have uh, not an efficient attitude, but still a good attitude towards balance. Right. Yeah. It, it's like it's. It's an unhealthy work-life balance if you're setting mm-hmm. that precedent mm-hmm. that the client is king. I mean, that's Cause, cause you're always it comes back to the survival of Singapore, that same line that uh, Derek had put yeah. in on yeah. uh, the podcast that we couldn't record or we couldn't upload. But so we I'm actually talked about it in the episode that you didn't show up for. So. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah, I do have to apologize about the previous <laughs> podcast. Right, um, I kind so of overslept. <laughs> so he did talk about that. He did talk about how like survival determines a lot of uh, behaviors here. Uh, like... So, uh, yeah, I mean, S- Singapore's culture is more about survive, uh, being, being the top of the top, right? Mm-hmm. Trying to survive, trying to be better than our neighbors. I think this is ultimately. I feel a lot of Singapore problems is largely due to our small space. Uh, a lot of problems in Singapore can be directed back to the fact that we are small. See, because we are small, and we are um, prosperous, so there's a lot of people. So there's competition. Yeah. So competition is the root of a lot of things in Singapore, right? Because yeah. of competition, you know, people want to do well, you know, they want to get better jobs, they want to do this, they want to do that, they want to be best, they want to be careful. So it, 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 it really develops and molds this characteristic in Singapore called Kiansuism. Yeah. So it's a characteristic in, most Singaporeans won't understand this word Kiansu. It means you want to be the best, you want to be this, you want to be that, you it's know, like everything you have first. to be first, yeah. you have to have everything, you have, you know, so it, it's, a, it's a hustle to be the best. Yeah. That's true. Patrick, do you agree? Like, is that something that you hate about Singapore? I wouldn't say the word <laughs> hate, but that was actually the thing I was going to say I don't like, is that I think the attitude's too focused on trying to be... It's too competitive, and I find that, like, there's too many of these ideas of... People can look down on other people for things I think are a bit too superficial. Okay. So, like, coming from Canada, um, there isn't this sense of, like... In Singapore, it seems like, like success and education are, like, top. Like, yeah. it doesn't matter how, like, unhappy you are, how much you work. If you've got, like, a good education and a good job, like, people look up to that. Mm-hmm. Um, and is that not And they'll the look case? down to certain other jobs just because they're, like, maybe they're, like, manual labor or something. Um, mm-hmm. That's one thing that, yeah, in, in, in Canada, um, because there's been a big demand for, like, um, skilled trades work, mm-hmm. it's, it's very respected, very well-paid work. 
Okay. Um, so you don't get that same. I have a few Singaporean friends that told me that like certain industries here are lacking people because for a long time, like if you told your parents like I want to do this, they would say no. Like that, that's an insult to the to really? your family. Really that you wanted that you want to do this mm-hmm. kind of work. So in Singapore, uh, just share a bit with you, uh, being a Singaporean, uh, going through our education route. Okay, so once we hit primary school and then oh. secondary school, so you can go through three prongs, right? You can either oh. go JC, Polytechnic, or IPE, yeah. right? Oh, so yeah. in Singapore, yeah. So we value high rated education a lot, and we look down a lot on hands-on kind of vocational yeah. work. Yeah. Right. So in Singapore, if you go to university, you're like, wow, university kid, you're smart. SI, uh, SMU, uh, NTU, NTU, NUS, NUS now right? it's like SUT. But if you go to ITE, which is uh, Institute of Technology of Education, guess what everyone Singapore, else is? The lingo is, it's the end. Yep. <laughs> I was about to wow. say that as well. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. most people, I have a friend in the past actually, she is extremely gifted in fashion and designing and that kind of thing. But when she was in secondary school, she was extremely depressed because her grades wasn't that good. right? So I talked a lot with her about how, you know, despite you are going to IT and all this, you know, just have to learn to ignore the white noise, you know. Ultimately, you have to find something you are good at. And so I have two friends. One of them, both of them went to IT. It turns out the other one is a brilliant cook. In the end, she's now based in Seattle. She has her own like pop-up restaurant thing. Yeah, and she's she doing was, really well. And the other girl who is good in fashion and all this, she is like working, she's going to Tokyo and Paris and doing all this sort of work. And Looking now at their so-called success and looking back at what they used to be, uh, I, I remind them how they used to be so depressed that they went to IT. You know, because society looks at IT as really something. It's, yeah, it's like it's, yeah, and you can't make anything out of it. Yeah. yeah, but I mean, I mean, I mean, that's how it was actually brought, like portrayed as previously a, back then. It's an yeah. attitude. It's a disease. I, I, think. I do. But here's the thing, right? So you're talking about how like certain fields of work is considered, you know, uh, beneath your your, your standing. Right, mm-hmm. and then you were talking about how it's not because it's respectable to have these jobs, right? Yes. So to ask you, Patrick, um, are there any particular jobs in Canada which you would consider beneath your standing? Oh, I mean, I think there's always jobs that like you might personally consider. Stop beating standing, around the bush. But there's less like <laughs> people are less. Um, they don't. They don't use that to almost judge the person as being oh, so who you they are. Do not Okay, they don't use your career if to that judge makes you sense. As your ed- yeah, and like your, your education and your background. Okay. okay. Right? Um, and then there's more of a and then I think there's a bigger respect for like hands on work and because that mm-hmm. kind of feeds into there's a lot of industries that require like creativity and when you have a if your focus is entirely like academics, it's very narrow and it's hard to breed people that like think outside the box. So That's you can get true. you can get amazing like doctors and get amazing like bankers, but if you need people like you need uh, fashion designers like or like chefs a, you're kind of like suffocating them. But here's the thing. So this is a question for both of you, Patrick and Umar. So, okay, it's not fun. Um, here's the question, right? So the respect, the perceived respectability of a certain occupation is often dependent upon the demand that that particular yeah. occupation has, yeah. right? So in, in Singapore, for example, there's a big demand for skilled work, right? In, in Canada, there's probably like skill, uh, demand for skilled work in other respects that's not considered respectable here. Um, mm-hmm. In the context of Canada, are there particular jobs that is not considered respectable to the point where you would look down on them for doing that particular occupation? There would be, but maybe, but they'd be more towards jobs that are uh, like on the borderline of things that might be considered unethical. But Could people you give really us an try example? to like a drug dealer kind of thing. No, that's not that's an yeah. occupation. That's, not <laughs> that's a lifestyle. So <laughs> people, might look, people might look down on jobs that they have like ethical things against. Like for example, like if you were in like the porn industry, or if you were like, you know, on maybe if you were like a doctor working at like an abortion clinic, things that are very like controversial. But, but people try to pull away your career from who you are as a person. So I, I've heard, yeah, there's less of a you know, oh, uh, like you work in this field, I I know who you are. At least that's the vibe I get. Okay. And what is that one thing that you hate about Canada? I can't speak for all of Canada because I've only grown up in Vancouver. But I find that um, it can be difficult to make friends in Vancouver if you're new. I grew up there, so hey, I had my group. That's, that's, that's this whole like, couch surfing thing, right? Mm. I, I've known a few friends who moved over to Singapore and they made friends by couch surfing and they're like good friends. Yeah. I find that it's easier to make connections. Maybe it's just because of the amount of like foreigners in Singapore. Maybe because it's so transient, but people seem to genuinely want to make friends. And like when you meet someone at a party and you get their info, you add them on Facebook, 
like they will there's a good chance they'll reach out to you again or if you reach out to them they will like make the effort to hang out there's less of that like you, you know you meet the person say let's hang out and you never talk again yeah, yeah, yeah. wait so are you saying that in vancouver i can't do that so i go like hey man no, you'll I meet, meet a really nice girl no no you'll meet, <laughs> you'll meet people but it'll be more of like you'll have to put more effort on your end because the person won't reciprocate because they'll have a set group of friends already from high school from work and okay. they might not be making the effort to make it's new funny friends. like in singapore we hardly hang out with our friends um colleagues but like see, i've, I've heard like, both sides of the story right so i've heard a lot of people talk about you know uh, living here in Singapore has been extremely difficult for them because they've had a hard time finding friends because of the fact that there are many people that they've met who tend to be quite cliquish. Yes. Mm-hmm. You know? um, this, of course, entirely depends on the kind of people that we hang out with. So, of course, as with any city, as with any country, your ability to make friends is entirely dependent on the people that you immediately expose yourself to. Mm-hmm. Right. So, Patrick, are you saying that in Vancouver, the general attitude is that it is hard to make friends there? That's what I've heard from travelers as well. Okay. Um, it's not that people aren't friends. But it's travelers, right? Like, maybe people do not want to put but in the effort. But even as a traveler, like, I'm, I, I shouldn't say travelers, like, people like expats. I'm like, I'm an expat here and I've, I've had no issue making friends. Okay. To the point where, like, I think, like, it's, you know, you meet people every weekend and you, you know more people that you can possibly hang out with. Yeah. Okay. You have to be picky with who you spend your <laughs> time with. Oh, Oh, aren't you aren't you like popular? No, but I like. Got, I mean, just I'm gonna pick. All right, am I hanging out with this guy? No, this person. No. Like, yeah, get, I'll hang out with this. Once you get a lifestyle of, like work, and all you have is like two days on the weekend, if you're trying to like hang out with every person you met at a party and had a conversation with that you've connected with, like there's no point, right? <laughs> Umar, do you have something to say about this? Like, <laughs> oh, no, no. <laughs> but maybe it's the mentality of like something. as a traveler, you're almost as an expat. I'm also like, I don't shut those doors. So okay. if I if someone starts a conversation with me and like I'm very open to like, connecting, I'm very open to keeping in touch. Yeah. Um, so I'm not gonna I, I don't turn something down. If they invite me to something, I won't. I'll try not to say no. Mm-hmm. Um, so here's the thing, right? So this brings us to question like the, the the foreigner mentality, which is that you're a stranger in a strange land. So uh, and I, I'm saying this from experience, right? So when I first came to Singapore, you know, I was new. I didn't know anything. I did not know who to hang out with. So I just spent all of my effort into building networks. Mm-hmm. So like you said, I would just go into any door that was open to me. You know, just find all the doors that I could and go in there. So is your experience based upon you being a foreigner or based upon, you know, you being you? No, like I've, I've if you were in Ka- Vancouver, for example, would you have the same difficulty um, as compared to you being in Singapore, where you're, you're, you're a stranger, you're new, and then we also have this idea that as a foreigner, you tend to want to put yourself out there because, you know, you have to start from scratch, right? But I think the, the fact that Singapore has so many foreigners in it aids in that way okay. and because it is a transient city in some ways that yeah. people tend to be more outgoing of course uh, like everybody's in limbo so let's all hang together yeah right? and everyone's always losing friends like okay. you go to a going away party here like every three to four months that is true so that people is tend true. to fucking annoying to be honest but they, they like, so they want to <laughs> make friends like they don't want to they're losing people they know they're open to meeting more but vancouver has more of those like more people that are settling maybe i don't know i doesn't have as big of an expat scene because canada's quite expensive so okay. most people there grew up there, so they have their click, and they don't really want to go beyond that. You can meet people, but you still have to put more of the effort in okay. to keep that connection. It's just easier to stay with your group. And this is true for any foreigner. Like mm-hmm. the reason that we're sitting here talking to each other is because we have consciously made an effort to get past that barrier. Yeah. Mm-hmm. There are a lot of people I know who have, you know, who have come down here. They're here for work, you know, but they're terribly homesick, you know, because of various reasons. You know family back there they probably have like certain personal struggles that they want to deal with and you know wanting to socialize is not high on their list of priorities so for folks like those yes it can be hard to break through uh, you know to hanging out with people who are living here in Singapore that makes complete sense um, what I want to know and this is for both you Patrick and for you Umar is that have you felt that struggle living in New Zealand and living here in Singapore like would you have had that struggle if you hadn't crossed that barrier? Are you saying that people are friendly if you're just stuck around the corner? Then this in, in New Zealand too. Like you, did you have to like put an effort into? You okay. know, I'll start. You uh, <laughs> okay. So when I first came to New Zealand, um, I actually. I, I was already doing couch in Singapore, so I did make the conscious effort to come down for their weekly meetings and you know, meet friends and everything. Unfortunately, the scene over there in Auckland, they tend to have more foreigners. 
they tend to be more foreigners. So I make friends with them, but I only managed to make one or two friends who are Kiwis, right? So after I left Auckland, once I started working out in the fields, then it was even harder for me. To um, yeah, because I guess most of the Europeans and all that they do this uh, because people who are in my hostel. There will be no Kiwis in Australia, right? <laughs> Why would a Kiwi stay in yeah, Australia exactly. when they got their own house, exactly. right? Uh, so my Umar, could, you, could you tell us a bit about uh, your work on the farm? Sorry. Ah, uh, yeah. So um, after I left um, Auckland, the city, so I was staying in an apartment there. I left to go to Monganui, so I was there uh, working in a Kiwi orchard. So uh, init- sorry, initially I was working in an asparagus farm. So I was living in a hostel there. Prior to that, I moved to. Uh, after that, I moved to a trailer park, and when I was in a trailer park, I worked in a kiwi orchard, all the way until um, I started to save up and then start to travel and then came back. But um, when I was there, my immediate surroundings were mostly um, foreigners, such as myself. So a lot of uh, students, young people doing. So it was difficult for me to. Um, interact with locals yeah. because there's not many outlets Correct. that allows interaction, right? Yeah. Even if it's culturally, most of them are foreigners, and not every s- little city that I visited has a couchsurfing community. Of course, yeah. So I think this is a New Zealand thing, probably because New Zealand has the population of Singapore, but it's huge. So yeah. Yeah. people are really sparse. So in my personal experience, it wasn't easy for me. It might be attributed to as well the fact that I was broke most of the time when I was there, so I had other issues to be concerned about rather than socializing. So it wasn't high on my list as well. But that's just my personal experience. Of course. So yeah, it basically comes down to what uh, what he said as well, like in regards yeah. to his friends who are working here and um, having our homesick and stuff. So socializing is not not yeah. their priority. Yeah. Right. So yeah. So there was a period of time before I was broke. I met a lot of friends and I was there and I knew people and we visited each other's house that kind of thing but after I moved out of Auckland it was much harder but I think this is unique to my situation I would not say someone else uh, who uh, is doing a working holiday travel would encounter the same situation as me I have friends who make lots of friends wherever they go so it's personality as well yeah we want to go to Patrick like I want to mm. ask Patrick mm. about like difficulties in meeting people so if you didn't put yourself out there like I'm sure that the first couple of weeks was like ah shit how do I do this how do I go out there where do I meet people how do I hang out like what was what was your difficulty I think if it wasn't for CS it would be very difficult because my first week I went to a CS event at ah, so yeah, you had an easy that's, that's how we met actually <laughs> like at uh, Zofie's, Zofie's. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I think it was raining or something, and we were below. Uh, and then, I, like, I was in the back of like I was in Junior's trunk because we didn't have enough room in his car. <laughs> and then we went to everyone's. Oh, like, oh yeah, but that's his party trick. Get in the van. And you're like, what? <laughs> but if, it, if, it wasn't for, if it wasn't for CS, I could see that uh, making local friends. I think would have been really difficult. Okay. I think I would have only had expat friends because like just working, the people that you like are gonna approach you most likely are other expats. Yeah. And then you'd start hanging out with them. So I feel like if it wasn't for CS, I really wouldn't have many uh, local Singaporean friends. Interesting. I think I think there is a bit of like a, a barrier. Like I, I work I don't I don't know how to maybe approach or how to start yep. that. Yeah. There's that like, cultural difference. I think Yeah, I mean C S basically helps you in regards to local friends because quite a number of us actually go there to you know just for drinks. Yeah, that's also there. But the thing is that and like like couch surfing tends to attract the kind of people who are keen on meeting people from other walks of life. Yeah, which exactly. can't be said of uh, all the, yeah the country at large, right? Now this yeah. would apply for Singapore, this would apply for Canada, this would apply for yeah. India too. So I'm just curious, like, like is there that difference? No, I, I think there is. I think I don't know how you would meet someone in the evening in Vancouver, except like in bars and stuff. Yeah, you meet you make friends, but still like but there's no of, one place to go to make friends. And I I've always wondered why there isn't like um, aside from like. Couchsurfing, there hasn't been like a uh, maybe there isn't. I'm aware of it. Internations, but, but some internations sort of like, is more of like networking yeah, rather than some sort oh, of like man. application just Don't to say like I want to. <laughs> there isn't like an app. There isn't an app for like maybe I'm unaware of this, but like adults that want to make other adult friends. Just like there's like there's, just, there's, 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 friend finder. <laughs> <laughs> there's like what are you, you know what I'm to say? Like there's ones for like if you want yeah. like this like hooking up and dating, but there's none to be like I want to meet another cool guy to have beers with. Who's down to make friends? That's a fair. And he's in his like 
mid to late 20s early 30s like, dude like, you might as well just go for Grindel and Twin Twin yeah like, <laughs> not, not looking for sex just want a beer yeah maybe that's awesome you, like, so I, yeah I don't know where you would you gotta go. be specific man I don't know, I don't no know where sex. you would go Otherwise. I guess uh, let's not talk about meeting friends with foreigners or first. We can talk about just meeting our own. Or just meeting friends. meeting people. But I think yeah. if you're a foreigner, um, mm. just you know, you're gonna like have that connection with other foreigners because they see you and like, oh, mm-hmm. you know, what's your story? Here's yeah. mine. Yeah. Versus, so I suppose most people uh, make friends through proximity, right? Yeah. yeah. So it's either you go to the same school or you're within the same neighborhood or you know you go yeah, to yeah. A similar hobby class. You know whether you're going to taekwondo class or you're going to bar. So I guess if you're talking about just meeting friends in general, there's a lot of outlets. Yeah. But uh, if specifically, I guess we're talking about you know, interacting, finding more friends, local and stuff like that. I think the barrier is slightly higher yeah, than meeting. Is. Although more it it does depend. Like for me, I think I'm like I'm unique. You know, being Indian and having like you know I can pass off as a local pretty much anywhere. Because there's always substantial like Indian origin community literally everywhere across the world. So like I can pass up as local until I open my mouth. Dude, so I can just you know, do my own thing. They're like you know, cheers to that and shit like that. The minute I open my mouth, they're like, oh shit. Even even in uh, Trinidad and uh, Tobago, you'll go there and like, yeah, you're probably like, like, like really like I I don't pay foreigner tax. <laughs> <laughs> I've never been caught for that shit. I don't get you know I get that brown privilege because of that. So it does give me an in in a lot of ways. I don't abuse that brown privilege, but you know. <laughs> it, it really I really hear this word going it. It exists. <laughs> no, it's there. So the thing is that the, the interesting thing about the Indian origin community across the world, the Indian diaspora, is that it's everywhere. It's all across the world. So I can just walk down the street and you'll be surprised how many people of Indian origin I would bump into. And you know, we have that causal connection. It, it, it's it like depends. even the, the stare that you get like for example I get this a lot uh, at work if I'm going out to get a coffee or tea or whatever and I'm heading back and there's a few gu- uh, guys maybe from India or maybe not they'll just look at you and they'll just stare at you and I'm like dude what's wrong with me like something a button like what <laughs> why is that at me I wonder whether all these subtle differences would make and uh, would make difference the fact that we are all guys here this is this is very true this is very true. We male, might have male privilege. Yep. We might have a different conversation if you know, say one of us was a female, and we might have our own different experiences. Because yeah. the way males and females socialize is, is completely oh different shit. We friends. need we need another episode with female foreigners. <laughs> I, I think yeah. that would be an interesting. <laughs> You know, you have you a really good point. You get a different side to Yeah, surfing. you give us another yeah, episode yeah. to think about. You get a different side to catch <laughs> surfing if you had females on here. Um, Holy shit. It's a different right, world right. too. Cool. Um, all right, let's move off. Let's move on to our third and final question. Back in New Zealand, what did you mi- miss most oh about man. Singapore? And back in Singapore, what, what do you miss most about New Zealand? Back in, okay, I can tell you definitely, being back in Singapore, what I miss about New Zealand, right? So, other than the, the weather, of course, the humidity is really good. Wait, you miss humidity? You miss no, humidity? <laughs> <laughs> who, who likes humidity? I, I mean, I miss the humidity there because it was non-existent. That's fine. Okay. Okay. <laughs> okay. So what I miss most about New Zealand, there's just something about New Zealand that reminds me of the adventures I used to have. Because in Singapore you can't have a lot of outdoor adventures, and I'm a big outdoor adventure junkie. So when I was in New Zealand, there's always just a lot of opportunity. Okay. Another fact is that when I was here in Singapore, I'm living with my family. So when I'm overseas, I have total independence, right? Yeah. So that makes a lot of difference. So I miss that huge or as Kiwi say heaps I miss them heaps right <laughs> so um, over there there's always that um, there's always new places to visit new things to do there's always things as long as you have the capacity whether it's money or time over there you can explore and explore and just go around and do everything you need to do whereas in Singapore it's very easy to like after a while living in Singapore for a while you get bored right yeah. so living in Singapore if you notice by now Singapore, we compensate this by having lots of events. This festival, that festival, <laughs> this pop up place, that pop up place. This year, we have a. There's all sorts well, of events going in Singapore. RSF 50. Events in industry in Singapore is really huge. And it's mainly because of this reason. People are always finding new things to do. Because we humans, we're always looking for new experiences. Yeah. Right? So some people may not be keen. People like, some people like comfort, just do everything every day, the same thing. But some people like as they crave adventure, you know. We want to try new things, we want to try new food, we want to try uh, new experiences. In New Zealand, it's so easy to do that. 
you know the country is big there's so many things to explore whereas in Singapore uh, you know you gotta make them happen yeah right? probably living in in Singapore for about one year do you think this is enough? ultimately you revolve to going back to activities where you know you socialize yeah. Yeah. because when you socialize and interact with people there's no two same conversation but let's say you have no friends the podcast <laughs> exactly so if you're in Singapore and you don't have a lot of friends it gets really boring there's so there's only so much Bukit Timah Nature Reserve can do <laughs> of hiking or Sentosa, and trekking or Sentosa or or whatever. Ubi, you know, actually there's a lot of things to do in Singapore but within one year I think you will have exhausted at least Oh, yeah. I would say you'll be uh, you'll yeah. if you do it every weekend you'll be done with it exactly like I've met locals months. in New Zealand who I mean they have not visited this part of New Zealand you know they have not visited that part of New Zealand they were keen to Screw go and they want to go I've, I've met people yeah. from India who are working in Singapore and the places yeah. I've visited in India they have not been to the places exactly. that I've visited so okay well to give you some context mm. India is yes. a massive yeah. <laughs> exactly. okay. so my point is <laughs> <laughs> yeah. so with regards to my situation what I miss Comparison because Singapore is small and New Zealand is big. It's that part. That over there, there are lots of things. So, to do. so basically, ultimately, you miss the adventures. Miss the adventures, memories, the experiences, uh, the independence. I miss the independence. Right? And mm-hmm. what what about in Singapore? Like, what what in New Zealand? What did you miss about Singapore? Like, what the food? Or the food, hands down, the food. <laughs> I guess I'm. <laughs> oh, that was like really fast. Yeah, no, I, I I know this because like I visited uh-huh. Nikki when she was in New Zealand. Uh huh. And the oh, first thing yeah. she asked me was to get some chili from here. <laughs> chili? Know, she missed it so bad, you know, she's like, yeah. you can't bring chili or else you don't come to the house. Is that a spicy food? It's not about the spicy food and everything, okay. A few things. Singapore is easy, you have access to a lot of food experience. And it's cheap. Right? Yeah. Also because it's cheap, right? So in Singapore, you have Thai food, Indian food, Vietnamese food, Malay food, Chinese food. Chinese like food every, food, other, every fucking cuisine. Yeah. <laughs> so in New Zealand, not so much. So even if you crave certain type of food, it's gonna be expensive, right? So in Singapore, although we are in Singapore, if I crave Japanese food, there's affordable Japanese food. Yeah, yeah. Over there, if you crave Japanese food, too bad. You're gonna pay a lot of money for Japanese food. Even though both of us are not Japan. <laughs> you know what I'm so in Singapore, I guess food eating is our national hobby here in Singapore. It's really true. Oh, yes. I have friends from the <laughs> east side of Singapore travel to the west side of Singapore just to eat at a certain place. You know, right? You don't see this in many other countries. Like seventy five percent of the conversation that I have with my colleagues are about which food court is the best one. Like my it colleagues gets heated. My <laughs> my colleagues basically <laughs> stop asking me about food <laughs> because I'll just say, you know what, I'm not really just choose whatever. I guess that's the Singaporean part in me. Who means the food? <laughs> so to answer your question, yes, I miss uh, food most. Right. Yeah. Everything else is pretty subjective. Oh, I do miss one thing though. In New Zealand, when I wake up in the morning, it's cold as balls, <laughs> and I. Prior to living overseas, I've never thought as waking up in the morning to be cold. Because in Singapore, when you wake up in the morning, it's not cold. Yeah, it's like just at normal, night, right? <laughs> it's at like night sweat you between the four yeah. days. <laughs> yeah. at, at night, it's cold, cold in Singapore, but in the morning, it's not cold. Right? Whereas overseas, in the morning, it's colder than at night, guys. <laughs> Why is this so? Tell me. <laughs> That's the culture shock. Yeah. And especially in New Zealand. Yeah, yeah. I'm not sure whether it's true or Canada. So you struggle waking up in the morning, you're like, uh, <laughs> Oh, man. So, so Patrick, like the question is now for you. Like, what is it that you miss about Canada now that you're living here in Singapore? And what are you gonna miss about Singapore if and when you live? For Canada, I think it's um the space, the mountains. <laughs> okay. the, it's just wow. it's like it's just it's, it's, it's so large. So it's like it's, one thing we would always do in Canada is just like stretch your everyone arms. Everyone has a car. Stretch your arms into the Because cars are expensive, okay. and you go on a road trip, and you can just drive for like you can drive in one direction for like ten hours, and you're still in the same province. Okay. So and we it's just like it's completely. The same thing. It's we just completely need, empty. We just need to have our passport. <laughs> and it's, it's completely empty, and it's like mountains mm-hmm. and rivers. So that Canada's really beautiful, mm-hmm. um, and it's it's a bit more laid back. So like culture wise, you know, the work life balance is a bit better. Like people. So are you are you are you saying? Sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt. Oh, no, no, go ahead, go ahead. Uh, are, are you saying that you, uh, the work life balance for you here in Singapore is not something that you like? Um. I don't dislike it, but I definitely notice the difference. Okay. And your days go by much faster. Like you get to work and you're not off to like I don't get home till maybe seven. I get into work by like before nine thirty. You know, Canada's a bit more laid back. Um, uh, you know, having getting well, like we, grabbing, we gotta a, make sure that grabbing a couple beers at lunch. This. <laughs> grabbing yeah. a couple beers at lunch is like isn't a big deal. You know, that should be a thing. Like I don't get this whole stigma about not having a beer for lunch. Yeah. <laughs> like, come on. How do you digest your food? Dude, yeah, like, people, don't, people don't look down at it. Like, yeah, if you come back to work a bit buzzed, you're like, I, I need a few more minutes. People just, people laugh it off. I like, if you need to work, like, people can work. Okay. But there's downtime. Like, there's no stigma of, 
Um, no, if things are slow, you don't have to make it look like you're working, if that makes okay. sense. Okay. Um, yeah, the FaceTime that you were talking about. Yeah, yeah, there's yeah. No, none of that. Um, so you can, yeah, point. people don't, don't judge mm -hmm. you. Um, but I think one thing I'll miss about Singapore is, as an expat, I've seen this other side of Singapore, that's the, um, the, the, the community of like people, of like expats and locals. I yeah. really like that here. I think it's, like everyone kind of knows each other and I think it's a really good community that I, from what, I have friends that have lived like across Asia and I think like from what I've seen, that's not as common. There's a bigger divide between like, I have a friend who's lived in like Singapore, Hong Kong and Japan yeah. and there's a bigger divide between like, you know, the local Japanese and the expats. Yeah. Yeah. I feel like in Singapore, given the transient nature, given that there's so many students here on co-ops, the yeah. people on contracts, the travelers, mm -hmm. you get this really cool mix mm -hmm. of, like, it's a cool community and it's very diverse. So, mm -hmm. like, in Singapore, what we call it is just Rojak. <laughs> uh, yeah, it's sort of food where you mix everything together. <laughs> yeah. um, but well, it's, a, it's, 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 like, you really do feel that like diversity. Have you, have you ever tried Rojak before? Maybe. I don't know what is, what is that? See, that, that's his politically correct answer of saying no. Maybe, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay, no. I'll just give you uh, some comparison. A few other countries who are also heavy on expats. Uh -huh. Think of it, think of Dubai. Oh, uh -huh, yeah. Okay. So Dubai is expat heavy. Just yeah, like yeah. Singapore. But there's a but bigger divide, no? Yeah, it's like, going to be so hard for people cannot to do things. make friends with the local Arabs there. Yeah. Whereas in Singapore, it's much easier. Yeah. Right. Yeah. I can't imagine what is the couchsurfing. You, you know, couchsurfing is already a good channel to break into the local. Uh, you know, making friends. How would the couchsurfing scene there be? Would it I be I like it's mostly? I feel like it's mostly expats. Yeah, yeah I, I think it's expats. mostly expats. So in that way, Singapore is good. Yeah. Guys, uh, Umar, Patrick, thank you for. Yeah, thank, thank you for coming over. Even though Umar, you're late for an hour. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm not by to buy. All right, guys. <laughs> uh, all right, so that's all we have for today. Um, and yeah, so the main gist of this episode was like um, being a foreigner in any country. Sorry. Yeah. yeah. Being a foreigner in any country and the things that they face or we face. Challenges. Yeah, the challenges. The struggles. <laughs> the hood. And the positives <laughs> and the negatives that we face. Yeah. So that was the whole gist about this podcast. If you're actually wondering why or rather what is this whole podcast about. So on that note, uh, we're going to bid you farewell. Uh, guys, please check us out on uh, Libsyn and also check us out on Facebook and hopefully we'll be on Spotify soon. So until then, see you around. Goodbye.